Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for coming. My name is Ali Stunt. I'm the uh, founder and chief exec of Pancreatic Cancer Action, and I'm also a 15 year survivor of pancreatic cancer myself. Um, really, really exciting to be in partnership with uh, the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance and to um, to have this webinar on the research that uh, we funded but was conducted at uh, the University of Surrey. And um, another thing I think in the housekeeping, Joe, is that uh, mics off. I think um, unless you're unless you're speaking. So why are we here today? Well, um, people like me are very rare in terms of being diagnosed in time for surgery to be an option, followed by chemotherapy and chemo radiotherapy, um, and affording me the chance to not only survive five years, but to be one of the 1% who actually live beyond uh, 10 years with this disease. It's our mission at Pancreatic Cancer Action to improve early diagnosis of the disease. And um, some of the ways that we do that is uh, through education of uh, healthcare professionals, through public awareness campaigns, and through research specifically into um, early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, among other things that, that we do. Um, pancreatic cancer has a bit of a poor relation in terms of cancer. Um, it's the 10th most common. It's the fifth leading cause of cancer death in the UK. And that's actually tipped to become the fourth, not because pancreatic cancer has got any worse. It's very difficult to get to be worse, but uh, also um, because uh, survival rates for other cancers have improved significantly. So we currently have a 7.3% five-year survival rate in the UK. When I was first diagnosed, it was 3%. So we've seen a tiny, tiny bit of um, improvement uh, in, in the disease. Um, unfortunately, here in the UK, out of all of the 38 OECD countries, um, the UK comes 37th in terms of survival of the disease. So, you know, we've, we've got an uphill struggle, but we are making some small inroads. And I'm, I'm really pleased today to be able to um, showcase the, um, the the research that, that has been done at uh, the University of, of Surrey. And um, I'm just going to stop there now and uh, introduce AGS. Um, so uh, AGS is the, the um, chief uh, researcher on the project, chief investigator, and uh, um, I'll put it over to you to explain what we've been doing. Thank you, Ags. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, and thank you so much, Ali, for the introduction. Um, and also thank you for organizing uh, to PCUK and Cancer Alliance as well. Thanks for having me presenting. So I will focus this presentation on the study that Ali have just mentioned. Um, PC, PC, PCA um, has funded the, um, sorry, did I just say PC, PCUK? Apologies. So yes, thank you for P P to, to PCA for um, for organizing this event, and also they have funded the data extract that has fed into this uh, pu pu uh, publication. Now, apologies again. That's that's an embarrassing thing m mistake to make. Um, so I will start sharing the screen um, and just tell me if you can see it. Okay, now I've lost everybody, but I'll just try and move the screens yeah, we can see it, okay. to be able to. Okay, thanks so much. So if, if you want to stop at any uh, me to stop at any point, let please let me know. And if you could or obviously also let me know as well uh, if there are any questions and I, I'm happy for, for, for you, for, for any, anyone to stop me. Okay, so this talk will be on the routine data for pancreatic cancer detection. I think I have a lot of feedback, so it would be good if people can mute. Um, apologies, sorry. Okay. Um, so yes, this is this is a talk that, um, uh, as I said a, a second ago, will focus around mainly one publication. Um, my name is Agnieszka Lemańska. I'm a senior lecturer in health data science, and I work at the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Surrey. Um, now, this is a little bit about me, but this is mainly to um, to provide a little bit of background to the study. So feel free to call me Ags. I'm a health data scientist uh, working at the University of Surrey, but also I have a joint appointment at the NPL. Um, my 
main data interests are really anything to do with NHS data. Um, uh, routinely collected data with the focus on uh, primary care at the moment. So I'm interested in data quality, data availability, data linkage and integration. And for this study, this was particularly important because this study links primary care with cancer diagnosis, and that's that's particularly challenging. Challenging. I'm interested in data curation. So this sort of going back to what Ali said, um, when PCU PCA has funded this um, this research, they have actually funded the data extract that came from a large database of electronic healthcare records. So if you imagine a large da database of uncurated electronic healthcare records, this would be quite difficult to um, to analyze. So curation involves creating those more classical tables that can be accessed by statistical algorithms. So I'm really interested in this. Um, and in terms of my research interests is primary cancer. I'm also interested in mental health. That's a little bit less than cancer. Um, survivorship issues and early diagnosis. And this this is mainly the focus of this study. But I didn't mention I'm also a pharmacist by background, so I'm I'm really interested in um, in healthcare guidelines and policy implications and especially policy implications of this sort of research. How can we do things better for patients? Um, OK, so this is the running order for this for this talk. I'll talk a little bit very briefly about the opportunities of routine data. Then I will introduce again very briefly the ORCID database that was used for this study. I'll present some results of the study and I'll discuss some of the conclusions and challenges. So the opportunities we know pancreatic cancer is really challenging, challenging to diagnose. I will not go there. Um, they are more qualified people to talk about it, but even to, to think that we don't even know how much earlier, earlier would constitute early that would make difference to the patients is, is, is even this is quite challenging. Now, in terms of the opportunities of routine data, um, what we are using for this study, it's, it's a large database. I will introduce this in the next slide, but we are talking about population based databases. They are representative of the general population because most of the people in the UK would have uh, registration with primary care. So they would be feeding in their data into, the, into those, this sort of databases. But what also is quite an important advantage of those databases is that they are representative of real life. So whatever is coded or with what what is not coded in in an electronic healthcare record for a patient will be in this database. So what we've got for research, it really represents what clinicians are doing with 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 patients in in real sort of clinical practice. So our research should be e translatable to clinical practice. I'm saying this in comparison, let's say, with randomized controlled trials, which are which have um, quite significant limitations in relation to uh, representativeness. Um, now I'm having trouble skipping slides, but it is working now. Mm. So this is a little bit about the ORCID database. It's a very large database. Um, it has 15 million of patient records, um, and it constitutes nearly 2000 GP practices who feed electronic healthcare records to this database. This database is governed by the um, primary care department at the University of Oxford, but actually the primary care practices that feed the data into this database belong to the Royal College of General Practici Practitioners Network. So this is the background for it. it, it this, this is the oldest database that actually exists in, in, in the UK. Um, and it was created by the Royal College of General Practitioners about 50 or even 60 years ago to provide surveillance uh, to the country and to the government about um, infectious diseases. And the graph only very quickly represents what, hap what happens. So the practices are mainly in England. There are some in Wales. Um, and these, the, this database is, is, is growing, growing very quickly, especially in the context of COVID. And if you think of their background of 
being created for, for monitoring infectious diseases. They grew massively. Now, um, it's I, I'll, I won't talk about the middle of this uh, flowchart, but you can see the external researchers have access to this database by a very secure means, um, and they are able to undertake a a project uh, such as this one, but just to say the research, the, um, the, the size of the database available for research is slightly less because the practices that send the data uh, have to have to undergo quality assurance before they they are curated into those databases. Now again, sorry, could someone mute? OK, moving on. So this is the publication that has been published in October 2022 um, in a journal that's called PLOS One. The title of the publication you can read for yourself, but we really focused on BMI and HbA1c as metabolic markers. And in, we, in, we were investigating how the, the, this, this, this information on BMI and HbA1c could help early diagnosis. So, this is a very, very brief slide um, uh, on, on the publication, on the study setup, and then the two last points are on the main results. So the study, as we said, was the population was derived from about 10 million quality checked uh, electronic healthcare records in the ORCID database. We've had nearly 9,000 patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer between January 2007 and August 2020. And we matched them to nearly 35,000 controls without pancreatic cancer. And just to give you a little bit more context on the study sample, we the average age I think was 72 years. Uh, there was an even split between males and females and 30% of people received a diabetes diagnosis at any time in relation to pancreatic cancer. So we're not talking about this uh, here yet any time. It could be at one year, um, one year old pa patient or post pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Now, the main two findings, um, we saw that at the time of diagnosis, BMI was lower for the cases than controls by three units. So people have lost significant amount of weight. Now, people with pancreatic cancer also have significantly increased HbA1c at the time of diagnosis. And then you can read yourself the odds ratios, but it mainly it says that if someone has lost five units of BMI in body weight, they were 1.6 more times more likely to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer that, that people who didn't. And also 10 units increase in HbA1c was associated with 1.4 uh, times more risk of being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, at the bottom, I put the caveat. Just this is because I'm, I'm really interested in the quality of data for research. Um, at one year before or after pancreatic cancer diagnosis, we had significant amount of people without BMI uh, uh, measurement, so they didn't have a BMI recording. And even more people without HbA1c uh, recorded in their electronic health care record. So this has created a lot of challenges uh, for the statistical models that we were uh, running in this database. Now moving very quickly, because I think I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite short for time here. This is a longitudinal plot that shows BMI at the top and HbA1c at the bottom before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So we've looked at six years before up to one year after and we can see from the top of the graph that about a year this this is the total sample we didn't stratify by any factors we can see that a, a really strong change happens about a, B, uh, a year before the diagnosis for bmi um so this, this this weight loss becomes for many people quite drastic so then again we have to remember those ones are average profiles for, for for everybody some people would have lost much more than this and some people would have lost um uh, less less uh, weight than that and then to the bottom slide uh, the bottom graph we can see that um hba1c 
um, started to change quite drastically about two years before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So we could observe those drastic changes uh, already from this sort of average uh, changes. Now, this is a sample stratified by diabetes. And again, BMI is at the top and HbA1c is at the bottom. We can see that um, for people with diabetes, so if you look at the top graph for BMI, people with diabetes would have higher BMI on, 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 in, in general. So these, th these are the people with diabetes. We can see that the changes in BMI have started a little bit earlier. So we per perhaps can say maybe even six months earlier, people with diabetes would start losing weight before they are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, moving on to the bottom graph, again, a very similar thing. The, um, uh, the, uh, the, the trends at the top are for people with diabetes. They would have higher HbA1c on average than people without diabetes. And now we can see that HbA1c changes for this group start probably about three years before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Again, that's on average. Um, and the last graph is just for com comparison. So this is the stratification by gender. And this is just to show that by gender, we don't see any differences. And this was more of a control graph, just to, just to show that what we are finding when we stratify by diabetes, it's a, it's a real finding. Uh, in here, we did not expect to see any differences between the genders, and this is what we see. There are no differences in the BMI and HbA1c changes before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Um, now, this is just to show everything in one graph. D these are the odds ratios that I mentioned earlier on, and I think the focus could be on the top, for me, top right, um, graph. This is for people with diabetes. We can see that the changes are stati statistically significant three years before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So now I will talk a little bit more about imp the implications of this later on. Um, but the main discussion points are that um, in terms of pancreatic cancer deficiency, depending on the location within the pancreatic uh, pancreat, pa pancreas, pancreatic cancer can, we know that, can cause um, endocrine and exocrine deficiency. And this leads to hyperglycemia, diabetes in many people, um, weight loss, and also malnutrition, which has a lot of impact on the long-term survival of people especially those who cannot uh, access surgery. Um, so this is the main opportunity from this study. The majority of people, uh, about 80 to 85 percent, will experience hyper hyperglycemia uh, between one to two, three years before uh, diagnosis. And this is similar for BMI. Between 70 to 75 percent of people will experience weight loss uh, one, about one year before pancreatic cancer diagnosis. So this makes those changes a really important markers for pancreatic cancer. Now, the advantages of those measurements are that they, um, they are present, we see from the study, even up to three years before pancreatic cancer diagnosis, so much earlier that those specific symptoms such as jaundice. Uh, but of course, the challenges are that these symptoms are nonspecific. Um, and of course, BMI increases with, with the aging population. And we know um, that diabetes is so much more prevalent than pancreatic cancer. So when clinicians are observing changes in HbA1c, then the first thing they are thinking is uh, diabetes uh, or perhaps uh, other um, illnesses with pancreatic cancer being so rare. It's probably not the first uh, diagnosis that they would have on their agenda. Um, now, so in conclusions, early diagnosis could be supported by this research. So we found statistically significant changes in weight and glycemic control starting three years before pancreatic cancer diagnosis, and this varied according to the diabetes status. Um, so we hope that even publishing this study already could make clinicians more vigilant uh, to the changes and to the link be be between those changes and pancreatic cancer. Now, something that's really important to me, um, 
especially working with this type of data, is the data quality. So I mentioned a lot uh, uh, about how many people did not have a BMI measurement or HbA1c me measurement. And then again, this varied according to the diabetes status. People with diabetes have more regular uh, reviews. They would have more regular entries of BMI and HbA1c. People without diabetes wouldn't have that. So the data quality varied for people depending on their comorbidity status, on how often they go and see GP, perhaps even if they experience uh, Body any body changes that they wanted to report for their clinician. So uh, a plea from me, this is that the regular BMI and HbA1c measurements are required to facilitate future research and implementation in clinical practice. So um, they are really, really helpful. Now, um, also in terms of the diabetes is that from this research we saw that only 30 percent of people had uh, diabetes diagnosis now so this is tricky when we think of diabetes um uh in terms of diabetes of early di for early diagnosis we know that diabetes is this is all complex. It can be a risk factor, but also it can be a symptom, a sign of pancreatic cancer. Um, certain it, it, it all it also that we know that diabetes will be developed by certain group of people only. So the focus on diabetes uh, perhaps uh, will only be on a certain group of people. Um, we also know that diabetes itself is a highly undiagnosed disease. So perhaps also it would be important to improve diagnosis of diabetes as well. And that has implications for this context. And these, these are the results from another study, nothing to do with this one, but this is just um, recently published um, uh, study, still as a preprint. Um, and it shows over time, starting from 2015 to 2022, the prevalence of diabetes in a cohort of people diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So this agrees with the findings from the from the study that I have been just presenting, we have uh, a proportion of uh, between 30 to 40 percent of people that will receive diagnosis of diabetes um, before or after pancreatic cancer. So this is a really large group. Um, now, I'll just summarize with the uh, with 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 the challenges. Um, so more research is needed to focus on those specific groups. So as, as we mentioned, the people with diabetes, but also with people with other pre-existing conditions, for example, chronic pancreatitis have been identified as a really strong risk factor. Um, and we can focus on other risk groups as well. Now, going back to the routine uh, NHS data um, and the linkage of primary care data with cancer registry, perhaps. We need reliable cancer diagnosis and cancer staging in data to be able to undertake research such as this one. So data quality is important, not only for the outcomes such as cancer diagnosis, but also for recording of all the symptoms, not only HbA1c and BMI, but other symptoms that can be associated with pancreatic cancer. So we have a range of jaundice, indigestion, uh, uh, back pain, etc, etc. Um, and we will be able to develop better statistical models if we can tackle um, uh, missing data. So um, more research is needed into really understand the, the patterns of missingness really in, in, in routine, routine data. Now, I just wanted to say massive thank you. Uh, just to finish this off, to, to patients whose data we are using for this research, uh, thank you to ORCID and RCGP for letting us use their data. Thank you for, to Pancreatic Cancer Action for funding this project and uh, uh, funding the access to this database. Thank you to also to MRC who actually funded quite a lot of my time uh, to, un to undertake uh, the research on this one. Um, uh, and thank you for the uh, to the audience for listening. 
Thank you so much, Ags. It's a um, really, really great presentation. Thank you for running us through that. I know um, if you're looking at the running order, we're slightly late, but I thought it's really important that um, we we heard everything from, from Ags. Um, and so um, with that, if you have questions, uh, it would be great to pop those in the chat, please, and then we can uh, try and pick them up a little bit later. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Joe Thompson, who's going to give us the uh, primary care perspective. I come off mute, that would help. Um, hi everybody, um, I'm Jo Thompson, I'm a GP and have been for 20 something years. I work in Sussex. I'm also um, a CRUK GP, so I have a real interest in early diagnosis of cancer. And I work for the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance along with Kat Hodges, who's my um, counterpart in primary care um, uh, trying to um, look at some of these things, so hence why we're here today. So thank you for joining. Um, really, um, I think, Joe Cohen, you've got my slides, so if you could pop them up for me, um, and I'll just talk through and around a little bit more around the clinical things that um, Ags was talking about. And I think the most important thing um, from primary care perspective being um, you know, a multi-professional organisation now really is that we're all aware of this. Um, and I think I know there's a lot of um, diabetes nurses and diabetes specialist nurses on the call. Um, and I think it's really, really important that um, that often the diagnosis may may actually be made earlier than than a patient coming through to actually see a GP or um, a primary care professional with symptoms. Um, <clears throat> So basically, as Ags pointed out, early diagnosis for any cancer is 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 crucial, really, because there's a much greater chance of being able to treat the disease successfully. Um, and that is definitely true for the case of pancreatic cancer. Um, it's also important that we diagnose the cancers as fast as possible so that the treatment can start quicker. Um, and also, we're now getting to the realms of being able to identify genetic makeup of an individual's tumour, which uh, allows more targeted treatments. Um, and also, obviously, because of the survival and the morbidity that goes with cancer diagnoses, the sooner it's treated, the more likely people are to survive, but the more likely they are also um, to be able to um, live with their uh, cancer in a better way. Um, so uh, next slide, please, um, Joe. Thank you. So that basically outlines all on this slide. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of pancreatic cancer and um, particularly around the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance, obviously working closely with Ags and her team <laughs> at the Royal <laughs> College. Can you hear me? OK. <laughs> Do you mind coming on or going on mute if possible? <laughs> um, thank you. In terms of... Uh, um, pancreatic cancer in the Surrey and Sussex Cancer Alliance area, um, we actually do have a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer than in other areas of England. Um, generally, there's been a 17% increase nationally um, in pancreatic cancer since the 1990s and survival hasn't changed or improved in the last 40 years. And, and um, as Ali said at the beginning, um, the the survive the long term survival is is really poor. So only about five percent of patients who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer survive for more than ten years. Um, survival data shows that if a patient is diagnosed with primary care rather than emergency presentation, their survival rates are three times higher at years one and three. Um, and the majority of pancreatic cancers are diagnosed in older um, people, but there is. Uh, a significant number that's also diagnosed in younger people and the survival for those younger people is much greater if they're caught early. Um, we know that um, we have an instance rate of around, England average is around 17.2 per 100,000 patients. Um, and in some areas of Surrey and Sussex, that goes up to 22.1 per 100,000. Um, so, and also the mortality rates, um, England average is about 15.5. Um, per 100,000 and it's 20.3 in the highest area in Surrey and Sussex. So we do have a real local problem. Just to put it into some kind of context for you, um, if you're comparing early stage diagnosis of, of pancreatic cancer, which only 21% uh, nationally are diagnosed at stage one and two, if you compare that with breast cancer, 
that's 85.8% of patients are diagnosed with breast cancer um, at stage one and two. So it's a massive, massive problem. And these, can, next slide please, these are the reasons why um, it's a problem. So the pancreas is kind of located in a quite a large space in the body um, and it doesn't often present with symptoms directly related to the, the kind of the expansion of the of the pancreas early in the disease. And so I think that's what makes it so, um, so difficult. Um, as Ags was saying, you know, it's really important to recognise those earlier things. And, and her studies really highlighted, I think, that, um, you know, the changes in the HbA1c, the weight changes in the patients. And I'll go on and, and talk a little bit more about the specific kind of symptoms that those patients may present with. Um, but I think it's just about having an awareness of noticing those trends that might be happening. And because our data is better now and we can look back at graphical representations of HbA1c, for example, we may actually see these patients presenting before they even get to a diabetes level. So they may be pre-diabetic, but obviously their, their HbA1c might be creeping and they may present with other symptoms, which I'll come on to, that might just ring alarm bells. And I think the key for me is that today is if we can all kind of take home that that are the kind of non-specific changes are as powerful as, as you know, the the uh, criteria that we use to kind of repair patients in. Um, and it's about recognising also the, the risks um, for patients in terms of their pancreatic cancer diagnosis, uh, what puts them at higher risk, and, and about educating our peer group really is, uh, to help them recognise that as well. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, so these are um, the risk factors. Um, so age, uh, I've mentioned the majority of patients um, that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are um, over 75% or not, not the majority, but a reasonable proportion. It's uncommon in people under 40, but it does happen. But obviously, like most cancers, increased incidence increases with age. There is a significant increase in patients who are smokers. Um, and the longer that they have smoked, um, that also uh, increases their risk. And one in five um, cancers are caused by smoking, pancreatic cancers. Being overweight um, increases the risk. Uh, about 12% of pancreatic cancers in the UK are, are in people who are overweight. Now, obviously, that probably correlates with the diabetes. But of course, as Ag said, you know, diabetes can be uh, not only a, a, a kind of risk, but also a symptom. Um, and I think. Um, the most important, and you'll hear later um, from, from um, our speaker who's going to talk to you about his own experience, is that family history of pancreatic cancer is, is really important. And again, I don't think we, we met, we kind of put that in our notes terribly brilliantly sometimes. So a family history of pancreatic cancer um, uh, in the UK is really important because about five to 10% of patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have a family history. And that risk increases further if uh, more than one first degree relative has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer or if the first degree relative was at a young age. Um, uh, pancreatitis, as has mentioned, obviously pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis increases kind of chronic inflammation of the pancreas and there is a link between that and um, pancreatic cancer and diabetes, as we've mentioned. Next slide, please. So other risk factors I'll just um, mention quickly. Obviously, any history of cancer increases your risk of having another. Um, so do think about that. Alcohol, again, those patients with chronic pancreatitis may have a history of alcohol uh, uh, intake above you know, average. But again, chronic alcohol use um, can increase the risk of pancreatic cancer. Red and processed meat, as with any kind of cancers, can increase that. Um, and uh, there is some thought that gallstones and gallbladder surgery may have an increased risk, but uh, I'm not sure that there's a huge amount of, of, of definite evidence around that, although, you know, there, there, is some there are some studies that show that. Next slide, please. Um, the signs and symptoms, as I say, are massively varied. And I think what the take home message from this slide for me is that there's so many um, and this is the problem and they can coexist with so many other cancers as well. So I think for, for me, the take home message is think about diabetes. 
um, particularly in patients over 60, but particularly in anybody that presents with diabetes and weight loss, as Zags was saying, there is a significant change in weight, even up to three years before diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. So that's really key. But also the kind of the softer symptoms around um, a bowel habit change, for example, often pancreas uh, patients with pancreatic cancer won't absorb fats as well um, and therefore they might have slightly oily, non-flushable, slightly smelly stools. They might tell you that there's a residue in the loo. Um, also uh, kind of nausea and, and, and upper abdominal pain, all of which are often you know, mistaken for acid reflux or something like that. And I think the bottom of this slide shows you know, the, the kind of the common um, uh, misdiagnoses, as it were, or, or you know, the, the com common things are common, um, but obviously think about um, uh, pancreatic cancer in people that are presenting with some of these symptoms. Next slide, please. And this uh, slide shows the um, NG12 guidelines. Um, so again, that that does show what uh, we're being asked to do in primary care. So. Uh, the NG12 recommends that um, you've got you should uh, arrange a um, an urgent direct access CT scan to be done within a couple of weeks um, with anybody with diarrhea, back pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting or constipation and definitely new onset diabetes in somebody age 60 or over. And then the NICE NG17 and new guidelines, which just highlights that kind of risk of diabetes and weight loss with pancreatic cancer. A caveat to this slide is 10% of pancreatic cancers will be missed on an ultrasound. So it's really, really important that if you're um, still not sure and somebody's still presenting and, and, and the ultrasound is negative and they come back with similar symptoms, send them down the two week rule to be checked with a CT scan. Um, so what are we doing? And the Cancer Alliance, we're trying to kind of raise awareness um, of this. We have, um, and my colleagues at the Alliance, particularly Lee and Keely, have done an amazing job of um, uh, putting together a toolkit for everybody to kind of refer to, um, which we'll show you a brief um, look at in a second. Um, obviously, we're supporting the Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and we're thinking of trying to uh, explore a potential of a primary care case finding project. Um, you may have noticed that um, the referral forms have been updated recently. Um, if you can just move on the slides for me, Joe. sorry. Um, and we're standard, we've standardised the referral pro formas so that um, we have got uh, kind of easy read kind of guidance embedded almost within the referral form so you can actually use that as both a, a kind of a tick box exercise to, to say which of the symptoms these patients are presenting with but also to um, reference their symptoms against so if you're not absolutely sure you can always go and have a look at the referral criteria there um, if in doubt use direct uh, use advice and guidance as well you know that's really important if you're not sure they don't quite meet the, meet the criteria do ask the question and advice uh, through advice and guidance. Um, just a quick show of the toolkit, if we may, um, Joe and uh, Lee, if you could move the slides on for me, and then we can have a look at the toolkit. Um, I think Lee, you're going to take over quickly. This is really designed as a as a kind of repository for information for for everybody to to have easy access to to these um these resources that we've pulled together a lot of my slides are in there so you don't really need to take notes um this is what it looks like um you, uh, you there will be a link to it at the end of the website uh, the webinar um and you can go in and it's basically um uh set out into nice chapters so that you can just access them individually or read them all together. Um, and hopefully you'll find that useful. You know, do feedback if there's anything you think is missing um, and um, and and do um, you do do let us know if you run into any trouble with it. But it's it's uh, all the links are working and everything. So hopefully you'll find that that's quite helpful. Sorry, I'm very aware of the time, so I'm just going to speak even quicker um, in terms of next slide, please. In terms of um, Sorry, Joe. Next slide. Whoever's, <laughs> I'll carry on. Um, is that think... is that up for you now, Joe? It should be on the uh, what you can do. Uh, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Um, so, what can you do? What we're asking um, of you, um, I think, be aware. I think raise awareness um, or, between yourselves 
um, and your peers, um, you know, just be aware of the symptoms that people may present with or the vague symptoms that people may present with and the association between diabetes and pancreatic cancer. Talk to your patients, um, you know, safety net your patients with diabetes. Let them know that if they start to lose weight for no apparent reason or, you know, if you're noticing that their HbA1c is going up, then, um, you know, tell them that they need to come in. Um, use some leaflets that are out there and loads of resources that you can share with your patients and think about whether you could maybe do some um, education events in practice use the notice boards aware raise awareness generally um, i'm going to come on to the resources that are available but i'm going to really briefly skip through those because you can look at those in your own time but there are things that are beginning to be di uh, developed that um, we can use in primary care that will help us to um, Kind of remember these and there are prompts um if you can just move on slides please so there's um in arden system one there's a new uh, pop-up within emis that that kind of gives you that information if you you're seeing a new onset diabetes uh in a patient over 60 um uh you know just to think about pancreatic cancer um next slide please there's also the q cancer score next slide that's um available through EMIS um, and that is um, that's something you can either get on the website um, but again you just plug in loads of data into the Q cancer score that can come up with a, a kind of risk for that individual patient and next slide please uh, Arden's have a cancer symptoms analyzer again I think just through EMIS at the moment but again there's links to all of these in the in the um, toolkit next slide please Sorry, more here. Cancer research. You've done a brilliant kind of diagram, which is for all cancer um, symptoms potentially, but but to link in with you know potential cancer types. So that's really helpful. You can get that in um, electronic and in um, uh, paper form. So again, you can order that through CRUK. And the last one, I think, um, is the Gateway C cancer maps. Again, you can look at that because obviously that's rather a busy slide and you probably can't see it. But again. Um, just more resources. Next slide, please. So um, there, are, there is a, uh, a kind of a take home message really um, slide that um, I think must have been missed off. Um, so I'll just verbalise that to you. I think um, for me, it's um, uh, just remember new onset diabetes with weight loss is a big red flag. OK, remember the risk factors. So remember a family history of pancreatic cancer increases your risk significantly. Remember chronic pancreatitis. Remember the changing in HbA1c's that you might notice. Remember the vague symptoms. So kind of um, oily stools, weight loss, abdominal pain. Um, you know, those are the things that that you might see in association with some of those changes in HbA1c. So, you know, think about those. Be aware of. Um, uh, repeat presenters coming into primary care. You know, think about people who keep coming back with symptoms that aren't responding to conventional treatments for gastritis, for example. Um, and safety net those patients, even if they've had a scan, if those things keep coming back again, you know, think about perhaps going down a different route with them, possibly do using a CT rather than ultrasound. And one thing I'd really be really keen for you to do is, is go away and tell um tell your practices you know to look out for early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer with new onset diabetes and weight loss um and by doing that you can also link to your pcn des referral quality because that will improve your referral quality by educating uh you know your your peer group the primary care networks about um the earlier stage uh diagnosis of pancreatic cancer thank you very much <laughs> Dr. Thompson, thank you so much indeed. That was really, really comprehensive. And um, I think we probably could have done a three hour session on all of this, um, but uh, uh, maybe next time. Um, and um, so uh, we do need to move on. And and then there are a couple of questions in, in the chat, which some people are already uh, answering in the chat, but um, those that haven't been answered, then I'll refer to um, um, after David has uh, given his, his story of his experience 
with pancreatic cancer, not only himself, but uh, another family member. And thank you so much, David, for coming uh, to, uh, to to give your, your side of things and your experience and talking about it with, with everybody. We are running short on time. So, um, you know, if, if you can, uh, I hate to make you do this, to, but to, to rattle through um, and, um, and, and then we can take some questions at the end. So thank you so much, David. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ali. Uh, my name is David Fullard. I'm an ex-career army officer and um, I was headhunted into the NHS just after I came back from the first Gulf War. Um, people said I went from killing to curing. I, I don't know how true that is, but there you go. So I have two stories to tell you. One of my daughter, my, 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 my late daughter and my own, two very, very different stories, uh, both of which will encompass much, much of what the two speakers before me have said and, and which we will recognise. Um, my daughter in, in 2015, 2015 presented many times to our GP practice. And I need to say to you that my GP practice, which I'm still with, is an excellent practice with excellent doctors one of whom was a friend of my daughter's who treated her and is now a friend of mine and is treating me. Um, I just wanted to make that clear. Diana presented five, six, seven times. She was diagnosed with IBS, with uh, possible ulcers, uh, UTIs, gynae problems, um, and, and her GP said to her, um, if it's cancer, I'll eat my hat. Um, I didn't make her do that afterwards, but, but, but the outcome wasn't good. Um, Diane was eventually diagnosed, I uh, was given a, 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 a um, an ultrasound, which NAD, NAD, nothing, nothing to be seen. So the two times I took her to A&E with intractable pain that, that, that needed intravenous morphine, um, and we asked for a CT while we're in a and &E, it was refused because she'd had the, the ultrasound. And my pleas to the, to the registrar that ultrasounds weren't, weren't infallible uh, were ignored. Just before I was about to buy her a CT, the GP got her one and she was found with stage four uh, non resectable uh, pancreatic cancer in the in the head of, her, of the pancreas. Um, Diana had nine months of living hell. She had uh, um, every every uh, chemotherapy, fulfirinox, 5-FU, uh, gemcitabine, capacitabine with radiology, everything. And, and she had nine months of zero quality of life because of the effects of the chemotherapy. But, but she was 46 and she desperately wanted to try everything going. In the end, the chemotherapy hastened her death uh, because her immune system was down and, and she died very suddenly uh, in hospital, fortunately, um, on the 1st of November 2016. Um, I can't tell you, having seen in my life some horrors in war, Nothing, nothing prepared me for Diana's death, nothing. We'd lost our son some years before that. She was the second of our two children to die. And I went into an abyss of depression. Just as I came out of it and was feeling good again, um, I, I was out on my bicycle and started coughing blood. I had a chest infection. Um, my 16 years in the NHS, the last two years as chief exec of my primary care trust, um, told me it was hemoptysis. I knew what it was. I wasn't really that worried, but it persisted. So I presented to A&E, uh, bloods and, 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 and x-rays done. It was September two, uh, 2020, the height of COVID. Now, I live in, a, in an area that was, had the highest COVID rates going then. Um, A&E was, was like a third world country. Uh, very, very terse registrar told me I could go home, watch and wait. Uh, and I asked him what my bloods were, and he was very angry that I'd asked him uh, until I reminded him that they were my bloods. And I actually wanted to know what my, my, my CRP and my, my white cell count was because I wanted to discount anything, anything more sinister. He changed his tune, referred me for a, for a, <laughs> to, a, to an, an upper respiratory consultant immediately when he found out what I used to do. And I was wrong two days later, uh, three days after that, I was given a CT at a time when there was a 10 week wait for CTs, called in to see the consultant. I knew there was something wrong because we weren't doing face to face then. Uh, um, and if you had a face to face, there was, there, was, there was something wrong. I went in, I was told my chest was clear apart from a 4.5 millimeter node on the right lobe of my, my, my right lung. Nothing to worry about at my age. British Thoracic Society said under eight millimeters leave. 
Um, and I stood up to say thank you and was leaving. And the consultant who I knew professionally and, and personally said, sit down, David, there's something else I need to show you. He moved his screen round, said, look, bottom right. And I could see my pancreas, the tail of my pancreas was dribbled up. Uh, the world dropped out of me and it was just karma. And I mumbled something like, well, that's it then. Uh, that's a death sentence. Thank you very much, Stuart, and left. He rang me as soon as I got home and said, David, uh, don't be so depressed about it all. Um, you've got a fighting chance. I've spoken to an oncologist, my oncologist friend. He said the tail of the pancreas and it's operable. I was um, referred to a very, very good surgeon who had started uh, the pancreatic cancer surgery in our local area in a teaching hospital. And I was booked in for surgery um, and then it was cancelled because of COVID. My surgery needed two days in, in 48 hours in ICU with, with a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, um, care and the, the ICU nurse had been taken off my surgeon for COVID. I then looked into buying it and I found a surgeon in London who was going to do it for £28,000, one of the Queen's surgeons it turns out, um, and uh, I was on, I'm almost on my way with my, my, my former medical director and friend who was going to drive me down and bring me back. When I decided I had 30 years in the military, 60 years in the NHS, uh, I, I, I thought I deserved better than that. So I rang the, doc, the, the hospital uh, chief exec who had stopped all elective surgery and uh, made my case and said, your COVID patients mostly won't die. I will certainly die without my operation. And two weeks later, I was operated on. I was meant to have 11 days in the hospital. I went home after five. Um, I was glad to be out. Uh, there was the, the hospital was full of COVID patients and I wanted to go home. And I came home with all my clamps and my, my drains and everything uh, uh, to my wife. In January, I was called back for the histology results and I knew by my surgeon's face something wasn't good. And he said, David, there's some not so good news. And the histology has shown that seven of the lymph nodes, or 26 lymph nodes that they'd taken out, um, had cancer cells in them. And I found out later there had been some circumferential uh, leaks of, of cancer cells as well. And, and it turned out that I was actually stage three and not the stage two they thought I was from the PET scan. I firmly believe in the six weeks from, from the initial diagnosis to my surgery that my, my tumour had grown. Because the piece that was resected from my tumour had cancer cells in it one millimetre from the end. And, and you don't need me to tell you how much of a margin surgeons leave in, in, in cancer surgery. I had seven, seven uh, months of, of chemotherapy, Porphyrinox, which my daughter had had. I had it on full, full blasts. Uh, I, I, I wasn't going to take any, 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 any weakening of, 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 of the chemotherapy. I barely survived it. Um, I, I had every, every bad uh, um, side effect of it that you could possibly have. I went from 14 stone to 10 stone. Um, I had frequent fainting periods. Uh, I fell down the stairs, I smashed my head open. I had rampant diarrhea for weeks at a time. I never, ever, ever rang in. Was, we were told to ring in after four days um, if you had diarrhea. I never did. I was frightened to stop my, 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 my chemotherapy. And I, I, I wanted that chemotherapy. I needed it so I could fight it. The outcome of it all is that, that I'm now two years clear. Um, I just had my, my six monthly surveillance CT. Um, there's no disease showing. I, I, I don't fool myself. I know this cancer will come back and kill me because it always does. I'm happy to be alive. The, the, the lessons I take from all of this is my daughter wasn't killed by the NHS. My daughter was killed by pancreatic cancer. But Diana's misdiagnoses robbed her of a chance to live longer because an early diagnosis might have given her a chance to have a Whipple and some extended life. Diana had no weight loss problems. Her H1BAC was good. We were very health conscious in my family. Um, not, I had no, no weight loss problems. My, my, my blood glucose levels were okay. Um, we had none of the symptoms um, that, that have been described other than, other than both Diana, Diana and I had an upper left uh, uh, abdominal, uh, upper left quadrant abdominal uh, nagging pain. Mine I put down to my diverticular disease. Absolutely in the same spot. Transverse colon down to descending colon. That's exactly where the pain was. 
And my oncologist said I was one of many people he's seen with the same the same symptoms uh, who'd, who'd, who'd misdiagnosed themselves. But but in all of this, I need to tell you, if I didn't know who I knew, if I didn't know what I know, I would now be dead. I would not have got my operation had I not pushed and pushed and pushed. N not many people would 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 take the, the, the or have the have the, the wherewithal to ring the chief exec of a teaching hospital and demand they get they get their, their, their surgery. I don't think doctors are listening enough to patients because patients know their own bodies better than anybody. I certainly do. My GP, who sobbed on me after my daughter died, she was absolutely distraught. And she told me that she'd been taught that the, the, the uh, um, ultrasounds were gold standard for, 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 for that sort of thing. She didn't, she didn't seem to know that the ultrasound wouldn't show up the pancreas very well in 10 to 15% of cases. I know, but with hindsight, everything's good, isn't it? I don't blame her. She did her best and she's done a wonderful job looking after me. But we need to listen to people. I also met patients while I was waiting for my chemotherapy in the, in the day unit who didn't have a clue about their illness. They thought chemotherapy was going to cure them. When I, I, I desperately wanted to tell them, go back and ask questions because knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. People were having chemotherapy who were suffering really bad side effects, who didn't know that those side effects were robbing their quality of life without giving them any quantity of life. And I think it's time that we addressed the whole patient doctor relationship in cancers and started asking ourselves, are we are we telling patients enough? Are we giving them enough information for them to make decisions about their life and death? My daughter had it all. She chose to have all the chemotherapy. She chose to undergo the loss of quality of life for the whole of the remainder of her life from diagnosis. When I sat in front of my oncologist, the same oncologist who looked after my daughter, I said to him, Professor, look me in the eye and tell me if you were in my position, would you have chemotherapy? And he said to me, David, you're strong mentally and physically. I would have it. We've got a chance with you. He sadly didn't with Diana. And that's really my story. I'm very lucky to be here. I'm very happy to be here. But as I said in my story online, if I could have changed my my circumstance with my daughters, I would do so in a flash. Thank you. David, oh my goodness, that's very powerful, very moving. And thank you for your frank and honest uh, version of the uh, of your story and also your daughter's story as well. Very, very moving. Um, the full story, which David has written himself, is available on the Pancreatic Cancer Action website. Should anybody want to uh, to, to read that, um, it's it, it's long, but it's really, really informative. So I would I would recommend that. Um, answered. Thank you to those who've been answering them in the in the in the chat. Um, we've literally got one more minute to go. Of, of thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers as well, um, Ags, um, Dr. Thompson, and also David Fullard. Um, thank you very much indeed for participating in this. And uh, uh, we've got lots of resources on the Pancreatic Cancer Action website, and uh, uh, so please feel free to go there. And if you need anything for your GP practice, then uh, just let us know, and we'll be happy to provide them free of charge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.